So hello, everyone. Uh, we do still have some people coming in. Keep on coming in. But we're going to go ahead and get started in the interest of time. I'm going to try and keep the schedule going on time. Let me introduce myself. Um, my name's Catherine Schmidtke. I'm in the sourcing group at Facebook, and I focus on optical technology strategy. And today I'm going to be talking about optical interconnects inside the data center and beyond. So the outline of my talk, I'm going to start by explaining why optical interconnects matter. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here talking about it. And then I'm going to explain how data center requirements are different. Data centers are, in general, a homogeneous, uh, homogeneous environment and uh, very high volume. And then I'm going to talk about some of the different interconnects that are being deployed. And I'm going to use a specific example of, of Facebook data centers, something that I know very well. So let's start by looking at a Facebook data center. This is a diagram of our switch fabric. It's something that we've been very open about. We've shared in a number of blog posts. And I've listed the blog post information at the bottom here so that if you're curious, you can go and find out more about it. The diagram represents the interconnections between the major components of our data center, the compute, the storage, and the switches. And you'll notice those colored lines there. These are the interconnects that connect all of the switches in the data center together. And those are all optical interconnects. They're, it's all run over optical fiber. And just to give you an idea of the scale of how much optical fiber there is in a data center, there's multiple tens of thousands of kilometers of fiber in a data center. That's almost the circumference of the Earth in a data center. Uh, so there's a lot of optics in a data center. This is why it's something that we're taking the time to talk about today. This is a, pic a photograph taken inside one of the data centers. I think this was Lulio, but it uh, doesn't matter. They all actually look the same on the inside, pretty much. Um, and for those of you who know a little bit about optics, you'll recognize that those colored cables, they're all color coded, uh, that's OM3 and OM4 multimode fiber. And historically, our, our data centers have all been multimode fiber starting at 10 gig and then 40 gig. That's what we needed for the kind of distances that these interconnects were, go were going to need. But that's changing as we move to 100 gig, and then we start looking at what comes next, 400 gig, terabits per second. This isn't something that's going to be sustainable over multimode fiber. So for the past year and a half or so, we've been making some very difficult decisions. I'm going to share with you the results of all this decision making processes. We're going to be using single mode fiber. And I'm going to run through some of the advantages of single mode fiber and what, in fact, we chose to use. We chose duplex single mode fiber. It allows us the lowest cost point and the ease of installation just because it's less fiber. You're paying for less fiber. You're supporting less fiber in the infrastructure. And there's a lot of benefit for that. So why did we move to single mode? Single mode, as I said before, allows you to increase bandwidth beyond just what we're doing today with 40 gig, 100 gig, but on beyond to 400 gig and terabits per second, all on duplex fiber, so it's a single strand in each direction. So this gives us a huge future proofing that allows us to depreciate that fiber plant over multiple generations. Very important. So now, single mode fiber, why did we think about that so, for so, so long and so hard? Why not just go do it? And you'll see right away uh, it's more expensive. So this is the big challenge, the 100 gig market cost challenge. This graph shows cost per gigabits per second. And this is just Ethernet links. So maybe we could look at some of the other links, they would be even more expensive. I've tried to focus this just on Ethernet. And this data comes from a number of different market reports. This isn't just Facebook data. This is market research. Just put it together in one graph so that it's easy to, for us to all read today. So we chose multimode fiber at 40 gig. That's the red line at the bottom. You can see it's considerably cheaper. 
we want to use single mode fiber at 100 gig. Oh, we are actually already, so is this, we got to the punchline already. <laughs> but it's much more expensive. At least what we were looking at a year and a half ago, it's much more expensive. And the blue line is single mode, 100 gig, and the green line is multi-mode. But we really want to have something in our data centers that's future-proof and will survive multiple generations. So why, why is this blue line so expensive? A lot of it is, um, it was designed for, for example, 10 kilometer links. And there aren't any 10 kilometer links inside a data center. So what we've been focusing on is finding the set of requirements that's common to a data center environment and then focus just on that and scale back. And it makes a huge difference. It's over a factor of 10 decrease in cost. This allows us to then go and use single mode fiber at a, to at a much more effective price point. So I, I said that we did that by reducing some of the specifications and tailoring it to our particular environment. So what was that? And this is OCP, this is all about sharing. So this is what we've chosen to do. Duplex single mode fiber, as I said before. The three parameters that we've optimized for our environment are the reach. It doesn't need to be 10 kilometers. All of our links are less than 500 meters. And this isn't just Facebook data centers. This is true of very, very many different kinds of data centers. So this is something that's common for the whole community. So specifying something that's shorter than 500 meters is something very useful for the whole community. Another parameter that we've tailored to our environment is the operating case temperature. So most of these links are going inside a building that Facebook owns, that we specify all the equipment that goes in there, and it can't get too hot inside a data center because real people actually need to go in there every now and again. So um, having an environment where the case temperature is 15 to 55 degrees C is actually something we do anyway. Why not take advantage of that and specify that from the beginning? And since most parameters are temperature dependent, this allows us to significantly um, reduce the parameter space that the, that the pro product needs to perform over. And then the third point is the, the lifetime of the equipment. Um, and I'm going to be careful how to phrase this. It doesn't mean to say make unreliable parts because that doesn't work either. But the expectation that a part has to live for a service life of 20 years, it's, n it's never going to see that. So why design for that, that end case? Because it's not going to happen. So this mean, in practice, what this means is there are um, some novel packaging techniques, some high volume packaging techniques that you can bring to bear here that are perfectly adequate for this kind of environment. So I've called this the Facebook optics choice, but I really believe this, this is something that we will share with the whole community <laughs> and that it applies to very many different situations, not just our data centers. Uh, the first thing is that you can tailor the performance to the specific data center environment. I, I talked about reach, temperature, and reliability. The second thing is we're networking at a very large scale. That means we deploy a lot of pieces. So there's very large volume that's supported um, behind this platform. And then the second point, which is subtle, <laughs> we move fast. That means that um, the implementation of this new design needs to happen very quickly. And that leads to my second point here. Um, it's a slightly different business model than how things were done before. Instead of iterating with small volumes and changing the design a little bit and getting a little bit more volume and iterating and improving the design a little bit more, it's much more about taking the big innovative step that allows you to deploy high volume from the beginning. So it's a slightly different business model to the way things worked before, but it's, it's very important for what we do. And then the final point I've taught this whole time about what happens inside a data center. But I believe that these principles, the approach that we're using here applies to outside of the data center too. This is a philosophy that we can extend to the wide area network and other places. 
And uh, th it's the idea of collaboration and sharing what we're doing so that we can encourage the whole industry to move fast to meet our needs. So th that's the end of the specific Facebook piece. And now we're going to do a little panel discussion. And I'm going to bring some of my industry colleagues <coughs> up onto the stage. Let me introduce them first. And then, of course, this. I have no idea where they've gone now. Anyway, <laughs> so here, there's a team of um, my colleagues from, from the industry who are going to join me up on stage. Okay, well, come up, guys, and I'll, I'll read your names as you come up. So from Microsoft, we have Jamie Godet. From Equinix, we have Ihab Tarazzi. Thank you, Ihab. And from Google, we have Vijay, and he dared me to say his last name, Visirakala. Okay. <laughs> And they're going to talk through uh, some of uh, the challenges that they're facing and how they're solving them using the same kind of philosophy. So I'm going to pass the baton to you. Off you go, Jamie. Okay, so I'm going to go through some of the uh, <coughs> field data from the Microsoft data centers. Uh, what you're going to see is some alignment with what Catherine said, in particular, uh, the bet on single mode fiber inside the data centers. Uh, but first, we'll talk about design intent <coughs> inside the data center. And uh, you know, we're talking about Microsoft data centers, uh, which are split between Microsoft owned properties and uh, leased facilities. So our number one um, <coughs> uh, use case today is what we call AOC, uh, active optical cable. For those of you not familiar with the term, uh, AOC uh, is a set of two plugs with a permanently fused patch cord between them. Um, it allows us uh, a great cost per bit and no fiber cleaning, which our uh, data center techs love, and it really is plug and play. Now this optic is only good for in room or inside a row. So when we get outside a row, we start to see alignment with what uh, Catherine said. Um, uh, little differences here though. Uh, our number two choice is PSM4, um, and we deploy these in high volume today. Uh, PSM4 is a plug that runs over parallel single mode fiber, so it's still single mode fiber but uses uh, eight lanes of an MTP12 connector. So we fit our Microsoft data centers with uh, MTP12 trunk cables and uh, we've cartridged the end with MTP connectors and we use PSM plugs and we believe that at 40 gig and today that is still the most cost effective way to connect uh, between rows and, and inside a room and even between rooms of a data center. Um, now, CWDM4 uh, is a very interesting uh, newcomer to the space, and for exactly uh, the reasons that Catherine mentioned. Uh, the typical specs of an LC duplex plug in the past uh, made it a very expensive part at 10 kilometers, et cetera. Uh, CWDM4 has relaxed specs, and there's even a CWDM4 light variant now that has even further relaxed specs, and it's getting to the point where it's cost competitive with PSM. Um, so, CWDM4 is is something that we're keeping our eye on. Uh, we don't deploy it in high volume today, but it is a part that gives us some flexibility in the future. Uh, for example, if we have fiber constraint in fiber troughs and we can't run uh, MTP12 trunks uh, to, to use 100 gig connections, we can actually get a six to one uh, fiber efficiency by cartridging the ends with LC duplex and running uh, six CWDMs over one MTP12 uh, versus one, in one PSM over one MTP12. So CWDM is uh, an interesting part uh, for the future and it will give us some flexibility uh, to reuse old infrastructure and perhaps reuse uh, fiber conduit and, uh, and help alleviate fiber constraint. Um, and last on the list here is LR4 and, and you know, it is really last for a reason. Uh, we don't uh, deploy LR4 in high volume whatsoever. Um, when we do deploy LR4, it is LR4 light. Um, uh, LR4 light is typically used for interop with CFP2 or CFP or other um, legacy infrastructure. Um, the LR4 distance of 10 kilometers just isn't realistic uh, for Microsoft. By the time you're, you're reaching 10 kilometers, you're outside of the data center campus, which means you're into the carrier metro fiber infrastructure. And in that case, you're usually thinking WDM. Uh, so the 10 kilometer uh, LR4 plug it is not a big player in the data center. So on to the data. Uh, the top line here, um, which is 1% today, increasing to 5%, is the duplex single mode connections in our data center. Um, so the 1% in 2015 
uh, was dominated by LR4, and for reasons I mentioned before, in not a huge use case. Now, because of CWDM4, we're seeing a five-fold increase in the use of LC duplex just in the first few months of 2016. Um, and this is because CWDM4 is getting cost competitive with the parallel single mode. Um, and we have projections where this could get even higher. Again, CWDM4 is, is an interesting part, uh, still at 5%, not a huge part of the infrastructure, but 5% uh, of our volume is still you know, a lot of plugs. So uh, you know, there's significant volume there and it is our fastest growing part in the ecosystem. Uh, down a little further, you see the parallel single mode uh, continues to be our number one use case. So that's PSM over MTP is going up to 53% in the data center. So that is a single mode infrastructure. Now, important to note that the PSM trunk cable, the MTP12, can be recartridged and used with LC duplex if in the future we find there's cost benefit to doing so. So our MTP12 trunks are single mode. We can use them LC duplex or PSM. So we feel that we future-proofed our data center uh, for the next 20 plus years by running our MTP12 trunks. Uh, and at the bottom, uh, exactly what Catherine said, uh, we have 24% of the ecosystem in 2015 was uh, multi-mode and we're aggressively eliminating the multi-mode use case and uh, this year we expect it to come out less than 1% of the data center ecosystem. Thank you very much, Jamie. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, hi. Um, uh, Equinix, just look at the right answer. Oh, yeah. yeah, hi. Equinix uh, joined OCP recently. We joined the TIP project as well, and we're working very closely with Facebook and others on bringing the OCP innovation into our data centers. Our data centers are uh, a little different, which is it's a multi-tenant data center. It looks like a mall. I'm mean, just trying to simplify it. We have a lot of tenants who come in, and the value there is not just the high quality space and power and colocation, but also the interconnection is the most critical part that people come for. They come for who can they connect to. And uh, this is a quick diagram of our, what our data centers look like. You have, uh, we, st we also use uh, single mode fiber I'll talk about, and we have a massive number of fiber cost connects. All the connections inside the data centers require some kind of fiber from people's cages to, from one to the next. Um, and um, so I'm gonna go to the next slide here. Um, and our, our challenge has been congestion on fiber. The, the amount of cross-connect and the magnetic power of the cloud and the networks is so significant, especially the last three years, we've seen a significant explosion of the cloud, both infrastructure as a service and software as a service deployments inside Equinix, and hundreds of customers are now connecting to them directly with massive amount of fiber. So these uh, magnets start to look like the old central offices in terms of volume. So what we use today is single mode fiber, and uh, you can see a picture of one of the trays. These things are starting to get filled up. So the first technology plan we're going to, still staying with single mode fiber, but we're going with high density cabling to, and uh, high density LC, LC patch panels to solve the, the issue of density. But our, our long-term solution is OCP, under the OCP project is that we really want to bring in automated optical switching and also ODEM CDC technology even beyond the data center so that we can give the control to our customers to activate between each other. And uh, what we want to do is collaborate with the community, everybody here on this panel, to figure out how we build that kind of uh, open source system using OCP optical components and allow that to happen all the way into everybody's cage. And that will be really critical in the future when containers can be spun up in milliseconds. So you want to be able to activate the capacity and move the data as soon as possible. I'm gonna give the clicker here next. Thank you, Ihab. So for my portion of the panel presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, the WAN network. So we saw some of the discussion around what happens within the data center. So as you know, um, the data from the data center, they, it needs to be connected across the metro to a peering pop, and it needs to connect, uh, get connected across a long haul network to other data centers and some remote pops as well. So the WAN portion of the network is super critical and we focus a lot on that portion as well. And um, what I'm going to talk about here is an architectural vision for how we see the WAN network evolving. Um, I'm going to talk about both the, the data plane building blocks as well as the management plane building blocks. At a high level, if you look at the picture, you'll see that the way we are looking at these, there is a, decouple, a decoupling between the terminal optics 
and the terminal optics here are referring to the DWDM transponders. So you essentially have a stack of DWDM transponders that provide your transport capability, and these are enshrined in boxes that you may have heard of uh, be referred to as the data center interconnect or the DCI boxes. So DCI boxes have come on very strong. They're in a server-like form factor, very compact, very power efficient, and extremely effective at providing the data center interconnect capability with DWDM optics in it. And the D DCI optics have to run over a line system, and the line system, depending on the distance that you want to cover, uh, it's a set of amplifiers, some muxes, some equalization elements, et cetera. So the key part of this vision here is a true decoupling between the terminal optics and the line system. So you deploy the line system, and then you pick the best of breed of your terminal optics, and they uh, run over uh, uh, each other in a completely independent fashion. So that is the data plane aspect of it. And the other one that wanted to highlight here is a transport SDN-based configuration and management. And traditionally, all these systems were managed by vendor-provided EMSs, and they tend to be very siloed, and it's very difficult to stitch different vendors' equipment together to have an end-to-end intent-based system. Um, you can bypass that, and you can have a direct configuration to both your terminal optics and your line system. And here, uh, we've indicated uh, that the collaboration that we are looking for is an open config, so it started out as a router switch effort, and that's been extended to transport and line systems as well. So the draft models are already on GitHub, so you can take a look at this URL. The open config has the draft models for the DWM transport uh, side as well. So just to sum up, the idea is to have a decoupled best of breed building blocks for terminals, line systems, and all managed with an open config and the value that open config brings to the table is it's vendor neutral and it extends the concept of a configuration from a server to a router to a transport element and that's basically uh, i just want to wrap up there okay great back to you catherine thank you very much it's okay i'm miked thank you very much everyone so i wanted to thank the the whole team my colleagues for industry for coming together here today and sharing some of the common challenges that we all face sharing that with you and I'd like to encourage everyone, this is all about community building, and together we can really accelerate the pace of innovation and we can move the industry forward together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.